You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Valladares, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Week. Actually, it's the, it's the lead play in our, in our offense. Tell the tackle to take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, we drive down on the first man who is inside. Pull back, we tell him to take the first man outside the offensive tackle. No one shows. He goes right by this and feels inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker in, he comes all the way around. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. We're going to do a little chalk talk this morning. You guys are probably going, man, why are you going live so early today, Clayton? It's a great question. I don't know, but we're just feeling it. I was into, into a little bit of film study and thought, you know, after hearing Jair Alexander's comments um, about Joe Barry and basically – you know, all last year, we kind of let Joe Barry fall on the sword, right? And and it's funny, man. Uh, we we heard Jair's comments today. And, and it's pretty amazing how we can all hear the same comments and have two different reactions to it, right? You can see uh, plenty of people in the comments that are saying, um, finally, finally, we had to bring somebody in to teach Joe Barry not to, uh, not to play off the ball. And it's like, Jair Alexander's comments, basically what he said was, I like to play off the ball. Now go back to the comments from last year and what did Joe Barry and even Matt LaFleur say? We want these guys to have input. We want them to be comfortable. We want them to to be able to play and line up pre-snap however they want. Now what's funny is when they asked Matt LaFleur last year as well, his approach was simply we need to execute better, right? He didn't see anything wrong with the scheme. He didn't see anything wrong with playing off the ball. He simply said we need to execute better. And you guys know I've been very vocal about that. And and like I said last night on Twitter, got raked over the coals for it. Everybody's like, you're an idiot if you think Joe Barry's a good defensive coordinator. First of all, I've never said he's a good defensive coordinator. I'm simply telling you what I'm seeing when I watch the tape, right? And, and it really is about situational football. It's about – um, crucial moments in the game. You know, we talk all the time about the middle eight. We talk all the time about turnover differential. We talk all the time about explosive plays. I don't talk about those things because they're important to me. Guys, I simply talk about those things because that's what coaches are talking about. That's what people inside the building. On these podcasts where they'll get exclusive interviews with with offensive and defensive coordinators, even head coaches, you know, like you heard with the playmaker or the play callers. Same exact thing. They're talking about these things. Jot them down and say, okay, here's here's something that the the coaches and the coordinators are really keying in on. And, guys, that's how they're basing their defense and their offense as well. They're trying to get those explosive plays. They're trying to prevent those explosive plays, right? So when you hear Matt LaFleur say last year, um, I don't think it's a scheme thing. I think it's an execution thing, right? And now you hear Jair come out and say, Man, I think we were making excuses for ourselves, right? So 
when you look at it from that perspective, it, it's real simple. It's all right. They they weren't executing the plays at the level in which we needed them to execute. It wasn't a scheme flaw. Guys, there's there's other defenses running this scheme all across the NFL and, and having a lot of success with it, right? So what I wanted to do is I wanted to highlight some plays, and, and this came about because a listener actually emailed me and said, hey, Clayton, you've been mentioning a lot about how the defense really turned it up at the end of the season, okay? And he said, how about going back and showing where they were where they were bad? And, and he was basically calling me out saying, you're just trying to paint this Joe Barry defense out to be perfect, right? You're just trying to, to highlight the good and not the bad. So it's like, okay, let's go back and look at it. Because, I, guys, I've watched the tape. I, I've seen exactly what happened. I've seen those crucial moments. So I went back to when the team was three and one. It's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to remember that, right, that – in week five, we both went in, both the New York Giants and the Green Bay Packers went into that game. They were at a three and one record. Okay. So things were peachy at that point. Of course, Aaron hadn't broken his thumb yet, right? The offense was looking decent, although at the time everyone was saying Aaron's just dinking and dunking. And then by the end of the year, it was he's trying to play hero ball, right? Um, and I don't I don't make these comments. I don't make these videos to try to be snide or dunk on people. Um, I just simply want to show you guys what the tape is showing, right? Um, what What is actually happening in these crucial moments? What's happening in the middle eight? What's happening with the turnover differential? What's happening with the explosive plays? And specifically on today's, on, on today's uh, Chalk Talk, the two things that are going to pop up are explosive plays and the middle eight, okay? And, and really, it's what cost us the game um, over there across the pond against the Giants. We got Zane in the chat says, good morning, Clayton. Time to talk about the greatest football team in NFL history. Could not agree more, Zane. Could not agree more. Let's do this, guys. Let's go ahead and show it. I've got two programs I'm going to use today. Um, and uh, both of them serve a purpose. This one right here is fairly new to me, so bear with me. I just want to kind of lay this out, all right? We're going to show two plays. We're going to keep this simple. Guys, I had about six, and I'm like, nope, it's it's going to take too long. Let's highlight two plays. So this, again, was week five against the Giants. The Packers were 3-1 and one going, into this, going into this game, okay? We were riding high. We were looking good. It was crazy. I remember I was on my way back from Kentucky. I went up to watch, if I remember correctly, it was Kentucky and South Carolina play. I'm on my way back watching on my phone, and we stopped at a veterans memorial on the way back. And at halftime, I'm like, "Oh, this this feels good, dude. We're we've got this game." And then watching it in the second half was like everything just completely imploded, right? I mean, it just some people could say we got too conservative with the offense. Some people say no, we should have stuck with the run. I've heard both of those arguments. I'm not going to even take time to entertain them because I'm not here to argue. I'm here to simply show what the tape shows. Okay. Um, so here's what we got. This is the second quarter, 4.08 left. This is a third and 13 play, guys. Uh, Green Bay at this point was leading 17 to three with only four minutes left in the second quarter. Okay. And we are in the middle eight. I'm going to go ahead and kill my camera for a second. Let me do that. That way it saves. No, I think we're okay. We're running, we're running pretty strong here. I apologize. Um, so Third and 13, Green Bay's up 17 to three. We are now entering the middle eight. The middle eight, what's the middle eight? Some people are going, what the hell are you talking about, Clay? The middle eight is the last four minutes of the first half and the first four minutes of the second half. Okay, this is something that Bill Belichick holds dear to him. You guys have heard Michael Lombardi talk about it. Um, this is crucial for the moment, momentum of the game. And, and really the goal is to come out of halftime with the lead. People go, no crap, Clay. Now, I know it sounds very simple, but it is what it is. Now, this, this program is going to be a little bit choppy, but I'm going to take you to some specific looks here in a second. What we got here, though, second quarter, 408, third and 13, Green Bay up 17 to three. We're in the middle eight. New York comes out in an 11-gun empty, strong right T week. Okay, what does that mean? They're in 11 personnel, one running back, one tied in. They're in a gun set. Shotgun formation, obviously, right? And we have an empty look, which means 11 personnel, one running back, one tied in. You have your running back, one running back, one tied in. Here's your tied in. That's your Y. He's playing off. And then you've got your T. That's Saquon Barkley, okay? That's what makes it an 11-gun empty strong right T week. All right, now we are in a nickel formation. 
Okay. We're in a nickel two, four, five, and we're going to come out. I'm going to try to take it ahead here for you. So you can kind of see, all right, here's the, here's the defensive look here. I want you to be able to see this, this mug here. All right. We're in the nickel two, four, five. We're going to come out in a nine, four, I five, nine. Okay. A nine, four, I five, nine. What does that mean? Right here, you've got a nine technique. Right here's your four. I see how he's on the inside shoulder. Some people would say that's a simple four. I'm not here to argue over two or three inches. Okay, it's not not a big deal to me. I would refer to this as a four. I he's playing the inside shoulder of the tackle. Again, remember zero tech, two tech, four tech. If you're lined up straight over top of the center, it's a zero tech. Over the guard is a two. Over the tackle is a four. He's on the inside shoulder, so it's a four I. Right over here, what you have is a five tech, and that's actually Kenny. And then you've got another wide nine. Okay, why is it called a wide nine? Here's your four, your tight end would be your six, right? So the outside show would be seven. If there was another defender, if there was a double tight end set over here, like a you know, a wing pair or whatever, right? This would be six, they would be eight, so he's technically nine. All right, now you notice Quay Walker here, what he's doing is a little what we call a uh, a sugar, uh, an A gap sugar. Okay. He's the will linebacker, right? Why is he the will linebacker? He is on the weak side of the formation. The strong side of the formation is always the tight end side. Okay. Where's the tight end? He's right here. He's opposite the center of the tight end. And obviously, Dre is going to be your mock backer there. Okay. Um, what you have is Quay playing the wheel. So he's going to sugar that A gap. All right. I just want to point that out. He's going to sugar the A gap. And as we go forward here, what you're going to see is we're in a quarter shell. I'm going to go back to this other look here real quick. What does that mean? What does a quarter shell mean? Yeah, you guys have probably already noticed it. This is your quarter shell, okay? You've got four on the shelf. They're all playing off the ball, right? And immediately people are going, Clayton, this is what I was talking about, right? <laughs> Why are they playing so far off? They're playing so far off because they're playing what we call a drop zone, all right? We're calling, uh, you know, I, I actually reached out to Coach Haddad and I said, man, I, I cannot figure this out, dude. I'm seeing some people play zone match. I'm seeing pe some people play man match. I'm seeing some people play drop. He said, Clayton, this is what we call country quarters, right? This is this is basically a spot drop defense, right? Now, you'll notice Quay really snugs up, but he's just being aggressive towards, uh, towards Saquon Barkley, okay? And I think that was probably designed with the game plan. Hey, do not let him get steam out there in the flat. I think that's probably something that was said. So uh, Quay mugs this A gap right here, right? And then he's going to fade back and he's going to cover Saquon. But this is what you call a quarter shell. All right, that's what we're in. Now, even though people were saying they're playing off the ball, notice where the corners are. The safeties are kind of playing the sticks, right? The first down sticks. Look at where the safety or where the corners are. Guys, they're three yards in front of the in front of the first down. They're playing – this defense is designed to prevent the first down. It's not designed to just, oh, well, okay, well, if they if they get the first down, oh, well, right? That's silly. It's it's absolutely silly. That's not that's not what this play is designed to do, all right? I promise you Joe Barry didn't come in there and go, guys, listen, just, just don't get beat deep. We don't care if they get the first down. That's not what he's saying on this play, all right? So the cornerback uh, – cornerbacks are in uh, three, three yards in front of the sticks. You've got 59 – to me, it looks like he's trying to play his own match. OK, he's trying to play his own match. And what Coach Haddad said with 59 here being Dre, what he's simply saying is, no, man, I think he's supposed to play drop. What does drop mean? Drop means right here. OK, he's looking to drop into this zone. That's what he's supposed to play. Now, as we roll the tape forward here, I want you to watch what he does. Drifts way too far, don't he? That's what makes me think he's playing zone match. That doesn't mean that's the play call. And the whole purpose of this chalk talk is to show you guys you cannot see everyone's reaction on this play and, and not come away with the end conclusion that there was a blown coverage, okay? So imagine if Dre plays this into a spot drop. He's covering this part of the field. There's no reason for him to – there's no reason, guys, this is, this is the whole purpose here. There's no reason for this guy to be here and this guy to be here up that top, okay? Now, what Savage is playing is what we would call mod, okay, which is man-on-demand. And, and like Coach Haddad said, there's a number of different ways, a number of different ways that people describe mod. But essentially what his job is to do is to take this number two right here, okay? This is your number two receiver. We're going to take it back. His job is to carry this number two. Now, you'll notice he's got eyes on the number two right here, okay? 
Here's Savage. He's got eyes on the number two. Now, some people are going, well, isn't, is, isn't Rasul covering? He's playing zone match or spot drop, right? To me, that looks like spot drop. So why is Dre down here in the flat leaving the middle of the field open? And what people seen on the TV copy is they see Sa- – this is what they seen. First of all, they seen the corners off the ball, and they see Savage right here, and they're going, see, what is he doing this deep, right? And, and it's a valid question. Like, if he's the one covering that receiver, why is he playing behind the first down marker? That makes no sense. Guys, it's because he was playing mod, and Dre was supposed to drop into that coverage, right? That's that's what the play – if he was supposed to play zone match, you would have seen him come way up and match him in this zone right here. But he's playing mod, which is man on demand. And, and just to kind of give you an idea here too as we take it back, these guys are all in mod. That's what it looks like to me. Now, they could be Meg, which it means man everywhere they go. But what is mod? Like Coach Haddad pointed out, you've got a threshold. It might be seven yards. It might be 10 yards. It might be 12 yards. Whatever that threshold is, this receiver here, when he gets to that point, this now becomes man coverage. Okay. If he if he just runs a little underneath route, right? Looking like John Madden over here drawing on a screen with all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Some of y'all are laughing. Some of y'all are old enough to get that. <laughs> if he runs this little underneath drag route, right? Let me clear that off. If he comes down here, guess what's going to happen? He's going to pass that off. He's not, you know, Jair isn't taking that, isn't taking that cheese. Jair is going to go out here and look for work. He'll probably stay flat until we get something in that range. Now, to give you an example here, if he were to run a wheel route, right? Let's say that Saquon ran a wheel route. Then what's most likely responsible here is you're going to see Quay drift into this area, play a little zone match, right? That's what I was saying. Quay, you can tell he's playing zone match. He's not playing spot drop. Dre is playing zone match. He's not playing spot drop. But they're supposed to be playing spot drop according to Savage's take, right? The way that Savage responds on this play. This is miscommunication. This isn't a flawed scheme. This is miscommunication and bad execution, exactly what Jair Alexander was talking about, okay? So let's say he does run that wheel route. Then what happens here is, If he's in mod, he's man on demand, and this guy, say he runs a slant route, Jair is going to kind of button up a little bit, but he's going to peak right here. And if Saquon comes out, then that turns into that deep zone. He knows that's his responsibility. Okay? That makes sense? Now, let's do this. Let's say they are playing mod all the way across the board, they being the four DBs, right? If they're playing mod across the board, Guess who Amos is keyed in on? And you can see he's looking right at him. He's keyed in on Saquon. Okay? So let's say that Saquon goes deep here, right? If Saquon goes deep and he stretches the field and tries to take that seam, who's in mod? Adrian Amos. So another thing that happens on this play is as we roll it forward, if you watch Saquon, Saquon does a little chip and he's going to run a little flat. Who is Amos covering? He's covering no one. We know he's not in a deep spot drop, right? Because if he's in a deep spot drop, he wouldn't even worry about this underneath. Although the ball is being delivered, he's kind of reactionary there. But when you go back a couple frames and you see that post on the outside, right? He's supposed to be helping cover that. He's way out of position. So if he's playing spot drop, he's out of position. If he's playing if he's playing zone match, he's out of position. If he's playing man match, he's out of position. If this was supposed to be a cover three and he was supposed to drive down that middle zone, he's out of position. It's obvious what was going on there. But I want you to key in on something as we roll it forward. I'm going to try to zoom in here too. I want you to watch Savage's reaction at the end of this play. Watch him get up and he goes, what are we doing? You see him? Whether Savage is correct – Campbell is correct, or Amos is correct. All of them can't be correct here. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? And if all of them ain't correct, that means there's a busted covers, there's miscommunication, okay? And again, all we see is Savage making the tackle, and he's way out of place. Savage was not even supposed to make that tackle underneath, right? Because he's expecting a spot drop like Coach Haddad said. And like Coach Haddad said, this isn't, I'm not here, we're not here to bash players. We're simply showing you can see Dre drifts outside. 
to me, it looks like he's playing zone match. He's playing the same exact thing that Rasul is. So that's where you get in trouble, right? So, you know, when you look at that play and you see Savage throw his hands up like there, you can see 59's confused. 31 covers no one, right? It's miscommunication and blown coverage, i.e. bad execution, which is exactly what Jair Alexander said yesterday or the day before in the press conference, okay? So wanted to point that out. Now, just to kind of kind of go back and show you what it was they're running, right? And I apologize for people on the pod. I understand this is hard to keep up with listening. Hey, just skip ahead to the next podcast. We completely understand. We know we we uh, we we get it, man. So on the bottom right here, right, you got the number two receiver. He's going to run somewhat of a post. Okay, you're going to see him actually. He's going to try to split what we call the apex defender right here, right? Dre being the apex, he's going to try to get in here and work the middle of the field, right? That's where he's going. All right, so up here on the outside, you've got the Z receiver, right? He's going to do something similar. So it's going to be kind of a double post. That's what we call a Dino concept, okay? So what they run here is Dino. And, again, as you roll it forward, watch a Dre drift too far over, bang, Savage reacts, makes the tackle, gets up and goes, dude, what are we doing? You're supposed to be dropped into that zone, right? Again, there's Quay. Mugging the A-gap. He's going to drop back. Look how aggressive he is. That's zone match. See, he's not playing drop. And and the, and the call may have been drop, right? If it was drop, he's out here. Dre's probably somewhere in this range, and you're going to tighten that window. Instead, he's snugged up on Saquon, right? So he's playing what we call zone match, which, like Coach Haddad said, in zone match, they refer to it as if and then. Okay, if he does this, then I do that. Right. So if Saquon were to have went all the way across the formation here instead of running that little that little chip release, that little T leak, if he were to have done that, then I guarantee you you would have seen Quay get out here and look for work. But because he's in he's playing zone match instead of drop, he's got to snug up on Saquon underneath. And I guarantee you the game plan was geared towards stopping Sa- uh, Saquon. Right. And then again, right here, you see Dre. Dre, this is where I think Dre realized, oh, crap, right? He's supposed to be covering, help cover that middle there. Savage is playing damage control. Guys, you know, I've been very, very hard on Darnell Savage, right? I've been one that's like, hey, man, if you see it, you got to say it. He's played bad. So don't think I'm here trying to apologize for Darnell Savage. I'm just – I'm simply, like Greg Cosell says, if you see it, you got to say it. You got to say it. Savage was schematically sound. Now, if Dre had come over throwing his hands up at Savage going, what the heck are you doing, right? Then you go, okay, maybe this was supposed to be a cover three on that side, and maybe Savage was actually supposed to drop down, right? Maybe maybe, uh, maybe Savage was supposed to, you know, spin and come down here. That would make no sense because you've got plenty of defenders over here, especially with him playing underneath. If that was the case, they may have been playing – you know, maybe some cover two invert where this guy would have dropped out, right? Or even cover three invert and he rolls down, right? You're kind of running some of those games. So again, huge play, guys. Why did I highlight this one play here? Second quarter, 408 left, the middle eight. What happened was they ended up going on to score a touchdown here before halftime. And that basically won the Giants the middle eight, seven to three. You guys know, uh, and I, I, I do it in a gambling sense. I say, hey, look, I focus on turnover differential in the middle eight, right? The team that wins the middle eight has a greater chance of winning the ball game. The team that wins the turnover differential has a greater chance of winning the ball game. When they won the middle eight here, right, in live betting, if I were to ever bet against the Packers, which I never do because there's no joy in that, right, in live betting, I would have taken the Giants and the points because going into halftime, right, after this led to a touchdown, they were losing 17 to 10, but they won the middle eight already. They're leading the middle eight. And when they come out in the second half, when we hit that four minute mark, you know, the uh, whatever it is, the 11 minute mark, four minutes into the third quarter, you're going, okay, I feel good. They won the middle eight. What's the turnover differential look like? Now, outside of the middle eight, they actually scored on their opening drive of the second half. So, you know, that same principle with the middle eight is there, right? Um, but it didn't technically happen within the middle eight. And if you if you start fudging those rules that you use, whether it's, you know, betting against a friend or whatever, 
uh, that wasn't technically the middle eight, although similar consequences, right? So that was the first play. That's how the Giants won the middle eight. Again, miscommunication, blown coverage, bad execution, didn't have a damn thing to do with the scheme. All right. Now, let's go to the next set here. This comes in the fourth quarter. All right. 9-13 left in the game. Green Bay and New York are tied 20-20. to Okay. So, keep in mind, we lost the middle eight. Now it's tied 20 to 20. Imagine if you had taken, I know this is not a gambling show. Okay. It's not, the, I'm just pointing out this is how important the middle eight is. If you had taken the Giants while they were down by seven, you probably would have been catching eight or nine points. So now it's tied up, <laughs> right? And even if the Packers win by seven, you got a plus one um, as far as, you know, the spread. I'm just, as a side caveat, this is what I talk about during the season. All right. Fourth quarter, 9 13 left. Uh, it's a tie ball game 20 to 20. This is an explosive play here. All right. This is uh, a second and 10 play. And, you know, we've talked about explosive plays over and over and over, right? Over and over. And people get tired of hearing it. And I've had people, you know, badger the heck out of me saying, oh, you know, if, if, if the focus is just to throw the ball down the field and then just play prevent defense all game, you're going to lose. Well, explosive plays has been statistically proven that if you land, if you hit on an explosive play, it triples your chances of scoring on that drive. They hit an explosive play here. And guess what happened, guys? They went on to score on this drive, the go-ahead touchdown. Now, how did they do it, right? How did they do it? New York comes out. They actually went no huddle, and this is brilliant. The play before, they were in 21 personnel. I can't remember if it was a run or a pass. It doesn't matter. But they were in something like an eye set or something very condensed, a running formation, right? They go no huddle. Why did they do that? They're in 21 personnel, two running backs, one tight end, okay? They went no huddle because the Packers – we're in their base 34. You notice them here? You got three down linemen there. Probably a little too large there. Let's see if we can do it like this. Let me give you some X's here. That's too big, too. You can see this is a new program, right? <laughs> Let's see if we can small it up, make it smaller. Here we go. All right, so here's your three down linemen, okay? So they caught them in a 34, went no huddle, so they could not substitute. Now you've got your base defense out there, and guess what they did? They flexed Saquon Barkley out. All right. This is what makes it so, so, so important to um, so important to be able to have a running back that can play wide receiver. Guys, we've seen this over and over and over. The running backs who can play receiver are going to be drafted high. They're the they're the, the running backs that are going to get paid. It's why Aaron Jones is on the cap for eleven million this year, and they didn't want to touch Ezekiel Elliott in free agency, they be in the rest of the league. It's why Dalvin Cook has sat on the market so long, although Dalvin Cook's a decent receiving uh, running back. Um, in Detroit, who did they draft? Jameer Gibbs, because you can flex him out. He's he's an absolute weapon. And I always – for the people that get upset when you say weapon, a uh, running back's a weapon, that guy's a weapon, I, I laugh at them because they, they still don't even understand what we're trying to say. It's what Greg Cosell talks about. When you've got a running back, that can split out wide like this, it's an absolute game changer. You guys have seen Bijan, right, down in Atlanta, making one-handed catches and running routes as a split wide receiver, right? They flex, they're going to flex that T out like crazy in Atlanta. And what did they show on tape all year last year? A heavy running game, right? Now, I'm not suggesting Atlanta's going to set the league on fire. I'm just saying that's the approach. This is why it's important. You go no huddle. We can do this with Aaron Jones. We did it quite a bit. Now, people got mad when Aaron Jones wasn't in the backfield. This is why you do it right here. You're looking to catch that defense. You're wanting to catch that base defense on the field. We're at an advantage now. Now, look at this, guys. We have a five-man front, right? I'm going to go to the other view here and lay it out for you guys, show you what we got here. All right, let's clear that off. So if you look at our front, what we're going to come out in, uh, like I said, they're going no huddle, 21 gun, strong left, doubles on, T-flex stack, H week, okay? So – They've got this guy who's going to be kind of playing that H-back. And, and honestly, he, he's probably another halfback. But typically, when you've got one out in the route, we, we refer to him as a T. This one we're going to refer to as an H. All offenses are different. Don't get caught up in the lingo, okay? The front that we come out in, we're going to, we're going to be stuck, like I said, in our base 34 defense. We're in a 34 under, okay? We're in a 34 under. Some of you guys are going, you talked about that the other day on the pod, Clayton. What is 34 under? I'm glad you asked. And under is when the nose tackle is in a one tech, 
right, on the strong side of the formation. All right, here's your tight end. Okay, there's your tight end. Where's your nose tackle? He's on the strong side of the formation in a one tech, zero, two, one, right? Right here is your one tech, okay? So your nose tackle is in a one tech. And then the other aspect of an under front is your D tackle on the weak side is in a three tech. Hark, looky here. We got him in a three tech. That's what you call an under front, okay? So we're in a 34 under. And the front that we have here, I'm going to talk about kind of where everybody's lined up just real quick. From, from right to left on this screen, typically we go left to right because we're from the offensive view. Um, what you're going to have is a nine tech. You're going to have a four tech. You're going to have that one tech in the nose, right? Then you're going to have your three tech. And then you're going to have another nine. Okay, so this is what we refer to as a nine four one three nine. Okay, some people would say 94-139 or 941-39, however you want to word it. Um, and what we're running on the backside to me looks like a cover three match. Okay. So we're going to take it back. We're going to talk about what this play, what actually happens on this play. All right. They're basically, like I said, they go no huddle to keep us in that, that 34 base. They're going to run a T switch drag spot mesh. All right. Some of you guys are going, what in the heck are you talking about? Here's what we got here. So your, Let's just start with the T drag, okay? The T drag is going to be Saquon is going to run a drag route, okay? Now, spot mesh, all right? T switch, spot mesh. He's going to get out. That's where the switch is, guys. This guy is technically lined up on the right side. He's technically lined up on the left side. They're going to switch places, okay? They're going to cross over each other. What you're going to see this guy do is come out here, starting out, and I think he was looking to wrap around and run a drive concept. So you got Saquon clearing this out, and this is going to be one of the later reads in the play. Okay. Now on this side, I'm trying to, I can't remember. I know, I think this is like a double move kind of go route. It's more or less a nine go, a nine route, and he just couldn't shake Jire. You'll see it here in a second. And right here is the spot aspect of the mesh. Now I would refer to this as mesh. Typically mesh is your double crossers. You're trying to get people to rub. That he's doing the same thing. He's just going to simply run at Quay's inside shoulder, and he's going to kind of sit down right here and try to occupy Quay. And I'm telling you, it worked to perfection. But again, when you look at what we're doing on the defensive side of the ball here, focus on 59 here, okay? I'm going to roll it again. We're going to go back to the – I'm going to roll it all the way through. I want you to be able to see this, okay? And then when we get to the view from behind the defense, I want you to key in on it. All right. Now that you see the result of the play, by the way, another missed tackle, right? I know that's Joe Barry's fault. But why was he that open? When people see this defense, again, let me, I just got to do it. I got to go back and show you. When you go back to this point, guys, what are you seeing? You're seeing these guys playing so far off the ball. Who makes the tackle? Savage, right? So on TV, fans are seeing this. What in the heck is he doing this far out here when this is the guy he's got to tackle, right? Guys, Joe Barry didn't draw the defense up to tell Savage, hey, play 20 yards down the field, and this is your guy you're covering. I promise you he didn't do that. So what went wrong? Watch Quay on this play, and I want you to key in on Devondre Campbell as well. This is how you know it's miscommunication. Guys, there's sometimes you watch these plays. Sometimes you watch these plays and you go, well, I don't know if they're playing zone match. I don't play know if they're playing man match. I don't know if they're playing actual man coverage, right? But the one thing that will stick out on a big play is if there's miscommunication. You could tell there's no way this guy can be playing man match and this guy playing spot drop. It, it, it's not designed that way. So there's got to be miscommunication. Key in on Devondre Campbell, okay? I really, really want you to key in on Devondre Campbell right here, okay? Watch him when this play go when this play starts here. You're going to see the spot come out from the wide tight end. Look at Quay. Quay's either playing man match or zone match. To me, this looks like man match. He's not going to follow him that far over. That's man match. And right here is what I want you to watch. Look at Devondre Campbell. What's he saying? Right? He's telling Quay, you got to take this drag. If he's in man match, right, then that means, no, he shouldn't take that drag. So Devondre thinks Quay is in a different defense. Now, is the mistake on Quay? Could be. Is the mistake on Devondre? Might be. We will never know. 
But what we do know is two wrongs don't make a right, right? Heck, one wrong. You, I mean, just one person not being in position and not being schematically sound shows you, okay, this was bad execution. Again, though, you watch it on TV, you see Savage that far off, and you think we're playing too far off the ball. No, we're not. It, imagine this. Let me do it this way. Imagine if Quay right here, if he just kind of jams that guy and he kind of snugs tight, he he needs to let him go so Devondre can cover him. And, oh, by the way, he would have. If Quay just kind of gives him a, jump, a bump there, right, and then he covers this zone, then this play doesn't happen to Saquon Barkley. Look at all this space out here, guys, all this space, right? The mistake was made right here. And, again, it's not to point, point it out and say, you know, to bash one specific player, it's simply pointing out there was miscommunication and bad execution, okay? So when you take it back again, right, you kind of look at how everything unfolded. Let's get past this play again. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, Everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. So when you get to this point, right, again, real quick, going to have a little switch, right, a little out. I'm going to try to wrap back around. going to have a little drag route from the T. This guy's going to walk Jair out, which, by the way, you could tell Jair is in mod coverage. This, to me, this looks like cover three. I mean, it's definitely cover three. To me, it looks like cover three zone match, right? That's what it looks like to me. It doesn't look like spot drop. And and judging by everyone else, I don't think it was supposed to be man match. And you you think, how can you say that, Clayton? Let's key in right here. This, this will tell the story. Let's watch right here. See this defender? I got the X on. Okay. Where does he go? That's not man match, right? To me, that looks like zone match. So if it's zone match, Quay was not schematically sound. And again, you could tell Jerry pointing to him going, hey, you've got to cover that drag. Now, what do we see on TV once again? You see Savage. Look how much space he's got to close, guys. I mean, you're talking about 5, 10, 15 yards, right? And you see the first down marker. The 50 is basically the first down marker, right? Right, you know, you can see it right here. So, you know, who's at fault? <laughs> the answer is several people are at fault, <laughs> right? But again, they did a good job catching us in our base, right? That's not on Joe Barry. Joe Barry can't control when a team goes no huddle. All you can do is just try to be prepared, right? And to me, they have more than enough bodies out there to make the play. That's the thing that that hurts. I mean, when you look at this play, You've got three defenders playing underneath. The problem is Quay cheats too far over. He's got to know they've got plenty of help over here, right? And if I'm playing zone match, then what I need to do is, yes, I need to slow and try to reroute this Y right here. That needs to happen. But also, you can't you can't flip your hips and just completely abandon your zone there. So what I see here is I think Quay is playing man match Devondre is playing zone match. And then, of course, you've got your mod defenders on the outside. 
and it ends up being a cover three is essentially what you end up having. Okay. And, and even though it's a cover three, you know, let's, let's just go on to the bad, the bad execution here. I want you to really key in on Savage. Savage comes down to listen. He's not going to be able to prevent the first down. That's already happened. Right. But what can he stop? He can stop the explosive play. Right. Now, listen, this guy right here, Saquon Barkley is one of the best in the game. One of the absolute best. So I'm not sitting here saying that it's easy to tackle him in space. I'm just simply saying if he makes this tackle, yes, they give up a first down, but it's not a gain of more than 20 yards, which isn't an explosive play. But instead, what happens? Missed tackle, explosive play. And, of course, it triples their chances of going on to score a touchdown on that drive. Therefore, they get the go-ahead touchdown, and that's how you lost the lead. <laughs> so – I just wanted to point that stuff out. Like, these are the things – I think when people hear me say, man, I watched the tape and that's not what I'm seeing, they just go, oh, God. One guy said the other day it's uh, – what? what how was he? It? It's uh, word salad. That's just word salad. That's it. Like, I'm just trying to sound smart. Guys, you hear my accent. I'm not a smart guy. But I do know this. There is plenty of teaching tools out there where you can learn how this Fangio defense is supposed to operate. And, and, and again – I'm not cherry picking a play that did had that had no meaning, right? There was plenty of them in this game too, by the way. Like, yeah, I could have picked out probably ten plays where it's like, ah, yeah, no, that's not Barry's fault. But those, that's in my opinion, that's cherry picking, right? That's simply saying, hey, look, here's a bad play that fits my narrative. I'm gonna I'm gonna point that out. You know, like many people like to point out, here's an open receiver running across the field, rather than going. Why did the quarterback not throw to him? Kurt Warner done an excellent job with Aaron Rodgers last year going, you can't throw – that's a, that's a, that's literally an ER ball. That's a hospital ball if you throw that ball, right? I'm not cherry-picking stuff. I'm showing you this specific play right here was probably – the first play we highlighted was probably the most important play, okay? And I'm going to go to a different program here real quick and ignore my ugly mug for just a second. We're going to go back to this other program real quick. I'm a little more comfortable with this one, as you could probably tell. So this play here, again, middle eight. We lose the middle eight because of this play, right? That's why I picked it. This was crucial. You get a stop here, guys, and we don't lose the middle eight. We're pro I'm, I'm telling you right now, there's probably a 90% chance we, we win that ball game, right? But this is the play right here that started everything in motion for the Giants to come back, especially in the second half, right? There it is. You can see Dre gets too far outside. Look at Savage, right? Right here. Let's watch it from the other angle just so you can kind of see. Watch Dre. If Dre spot drops here, imagine he spot drops here, that's cover, right? That's what Savage is talking about. Savage did not expect him to play it like that. And then again on this play, you're going to see the drag come across. Watch Quay. He's playing man match. Leaves that voided. Horrible missed tackle by Darnell Savage. That gives up the explosive play. And again, that play came in the fourth quarter and was and led to the go-ahead touchdown. That's how important explosive plays are. And that's also why these type of running backs are going to get paid and others aren't. And it's why Saquon actually had a little bit of an argument. Although you can you can go argue with a tree, probably have more luck than arguing with these owners about overpaying running backs. But they've got Saquon in a bad spot. They could just franchise him every year, you know, um, and they may end up doing that. <clears throat> but, again, that's what makes it so valuable when a running back can play wide receiver because, again, they went no huddle, kept us in a 34 base. I hope we do a little bit of this. If there's one thing I hope Matt LaFleur does this year is he brings a little bit of that uh, that turbo package that they use in Atlanta when they when – they, played so well with Matt Ryan down there. This is what you call a turbo, you know, muddle huddle, no huddle, whatever. You can install a package where you've got a number of different route concepts, and then you can even go back to the run in it, which why would you? You've got them at the disadvantage now. They go no huddle, catch us in our 34 base, and that running back might as well be a receiver. Aaron, Imagine Aaron Drone, Jones running this track, right? Some of you guys are going, well, it never works for us. I'll tell you why it don't work. This guy right here was probably schematically sound. Now, 
We like to bash PFF, right? I didn't look at the PFF grade until afterwards, and I'm not going to take the time to pull it up. I know it was in the 40s, guys. Our coverage grade as a defense was in the 40s on PFF as a team. But yet, Aaron Rodgers is the reason we lost that game. Not running the ball enough is the reason we lost that game. Joe Barry is the reason we lost that game because these guys are playing too far off the line of scrimmage. No, it was bad execution. It was horrible tackling. It was bad coverage. It was good game planning by the Giants, catching us in that base with a no huddle, right, and having a running back who's freaking elite with the ball in his hands. Now, some of you guys are saying, you know, hey, dude, you're full of crap, whatever. This is Joe Barry's fault, um, you know. And Joe Barry, Joe Barry needs to make these guys play up on the line, this and that, right? All I heard last year was let your best players play. Let Jair snug up on it. Let Jair do what he wants to do. You know, hindsight's 2020, right? Like everybody last year was just saying, why, why not just let Jair follow the number one? Why not let Jair play how he wants to play? I'm going to play something here for you. I'm hoping you can hear it. I don't know if I shared the sound. So let me go back and reshare it just to make sure. I want you to be able to hear uh, Jair Alexander's comments here. I think the sound's on. It looks like it is. Let's go back and share it one more time here. I just want to make sure that you guys can hear this. Because it's it's huge, man. It's huge. And and props, kudos to Jair too, man. I'm going to crank it up. I hope it ain't too loud, but I want you guys to be able to hear it. That there's nothing that drives me crazier than listening to a pod or watching a video and I can't hear what's being said. I'm getting old, I guess is what it is. But listen to Jair right here, guys. I mean, I think last year we was making a bunch of excuses for ourselves. And, you know, I mean, you know, Joe Barry can go out and, and, you know, call whatever call he wants to. But at the end of the day, we got to execute that call. And I think we were making a lot of excuses for why we wasn't, you know, especially early on in the year. At this point, like, we are good enough on the, in the defense to, like, execute the call, you know. So it's not, I don't think at this point it's about the call. It's about how we execute, you know. So I think that's the biggest thing that that we've come together as a defense. I think last year we was making a bunch of excuses for ourselves and, you know, I mean, you know, Joe Barry can go out and, and, you know, call whatever call he wants to. But at the end of the day, we got to execute that call. And I think we were making a lot of excuses for why we wasn't, you know, especially early on in the year. At this point, like, we are good enough on the, in the defense to, like, execute the call, you know. So it's not, I don't think at this point it's about the call. It's about how we execute, you know. So I think that's the biggest thing that, that we've come together. All right, you get the idea. So – I hope all that makes sense, right? Um, I love that Jair took responsibility. Um, what's amazing, though, is on that text thread, I believe it was Ryan Wood that shared that video that I've seen it, so I want to give props to him. I believe that's who it was. Um, you know, he posts that video where Jair is basically saying, you know, look, he can call whatever play he wants. If we don't execute, then it don't matter, right? And – when, when I watched the tape last year, and again, I would point it out, boy, and I'm telling you, it was like smacking a hornet's nest. They they came out of the woodworks going, this dumb redneck ain't got a clue what he's talking about. Joe Barry's horrible. Joe Barry bad. Joe Barry bad. Joe Barry bad. That's all, you know, that's all anyone wants to repeat. And I got to admit, man, the reason people do that is because they hear other people say it, and then it just latches on. Well, that's got to be the problem. It can't be all the first-round picks, right? And that, see, that's my argument, too. Some people are saying, well, maybe this defense is too complex. It's too complex. For a, fir a former first-round pick who's been in the league for however long, Quay Walker, maybe it, maybe it applied there, right? Um, I, listen, I, I'm not trying to come here as a know-it-all, all right? There, I, I know this much about football, and, and I'm learning every day. And it's important to me to constantly be trying to develop that and, and understand things at a different level. It's why we have the guests on that we have. You know, I don't want to just get in here and turn this into an echo chamber like everybody did. Not everybody, like a lot of people did with Aaron last year and this and that. Not not wanting to identify exactly what the problem is. They just simply wanted to to complain and get in their echo chamber and complain. I don't want that to be that. That's why I bring on Mike Wall to go, Mike, smack me in the mouth here, man. Tell me where I'm wrong. What am I not getting here? Why do I bring Mike Wall in? Because he's a former offensive lineman. Played in the league for forever former Pro Bowl offensive lineman, right? 
Um, I bring Coach Haddad Haddad on. Why do I bring Coach Haddad on? Coach Haddad is way younger than I am, guys. That's a good thing. These people that think that this next generation of football coaches and players and everything, oh, we should sit down. I've been doing this for years. Let me tell you what it was like being a fan in the 80s. And I love history. You guys know I love history. But it it doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what your background is, what your race is, what your economical status is. None of that matters. What matters is how hard are you working to study the game and are you accurate in your depiction of what's actually happened on the field. And that's why I brought Coach Haddad on. Coach Haddad, you know, they won the 2021 USA Today Staff of the Year Award in high school football, right? And what a blessing it was for him to come on. And I even advised to him on this. Shot him a message. Hey, man, what are you seeing here? Yep. He's he's supposed to be playing spot drop there. Got it. That's exactly what I seen. Just wanted to make sure because you can never be too sure. All right. Cool. Let's go to the chat real quick. Um, I'm sure there, there may be some people dis, uh, disagreeing in here, and that's okay. We can respectfully disagree. Let's see what the see what the chat says, and we'll get you guys out of here. Cheesehead Murph says, uh, Grand Rising Clayton. Man, that's, that's a solid introduction there, right? Or – you know, it's like right up there with salutations, man. I like it. I made it back at work listening. Tell me something, brother. All right, hopefully that helped, man. Like I said, just trying to break down the tape and, and kind of give you an idea of where the miscommunication happened. Uh, here we got a uh, Pensy Pack fan. I think they're new, man. Never heard, never heard of them in the chat. Did the communication get better at the end of the year? Was that why they performed better? Absolutely. That's what I see. Now, again, we I'm not going to pretend to be a mind reader like the people – on Twitter right now, that same thread that Ryan that that Ryan put up there, right? Ryan Wood did. Underneath it, people were going, "Well, thank God they finally got the, the DB coach in here to show Joe Barry how to run defense." <laughs> I'm like, Jire just told you that that it was their fault, bad execution, had nothing to do with how they aligned, right? Something else Jire went on to say that you won't hear them mention was he he basically it was in a tweet. Um, Someone tweeted out, I think Ryan might have tweeted it out too, Ryan Wood, said, uh, um, let's see, it says, Jair also said he is the one who chose to play off because that's what he prefers. Quote, sometimes I have a tendency to play a little farther off. Guys, that's that's where he's comfortable, right? And what did Joe Barry do? Joe Barry said, all right, man, hey, look, you're a pro bowler, dude. You play at your comfort level. That's what you're comfortable with, roll with it, Right. And last year, everybody's going, man, Jair's way too good to be playing that far off the ball. Joe Barry needs to get his head out of his butt and let Jair, let Jair play up on the line. And now Jair's saying, no, I'm more comfortable playing off. That was my preference. That's what I chose. The comment at the end of the year was, we're allowing these guys to have some say in the defense and, and how they want to play it, how they want to, you know, to, to perform the, the end goal of the quarter's coverage, right? And everybody immediately, not everybody, not everybody, the ones who refuse to believe this is what's happening on the field, their response is real simple. You know, one guy said, well, you really going to sit here and tell me that Jair thinks Joe Barry's a good coach? I said, well, did he say he wasn't? Did he say it was Joe Barry's fault? No. Okay, so you're mind reading there, moron. That's what you're doing. You're mind reading. So, again, man, the truth matters. Right. If you see it, you got to say it. That's the whole purpose of this. So, yeah, to answer your question, uh, Pensy, um, the communication get better at the end of the year. Yeah, I think it did. They changed some stuff, didn't they? What did they change? That's what cracks me up. Well, they changed. It's, they finally wisened up and changed the defense. And I always ask, what did they change? What did they change about this defense? And they can never tell you. <laughs> but that's why I ask for, you know, people get get really, really uh I don't know, tickled at the fact that I'll say, give me a timestamp. Guys, I'm being serious. <laughs> give me a time a timestamp on a video. Show me where they said it. Show me where you've seen it on tape. If you can't do that, then all you're doing is complaining. That's okay. I'm not going to tell you how to fan, but you're not going to climb in my mentions and go, you really think Joe Barry's a good coach? I never said Joe Barry was a good coach. I'm simply showing you what the tape is saying. That's it. That's all I'm doing. So, um, Eric Sutherland in the chat says we should have flexed Eddie Lacy out more. <laughs> Boy, that would have been fun, wouldn't it? I, I, I'm a big Eddie Lacy fan, man. That's one guy. I got to get an autograph on the wall from him. Man, it was so much fun watching him play. Watching him play was just absolutely awesome. Zane in the chat says, love your football knowledge. I could watch you all every day. Hey, appreciate it, Zane, man. We're just all trying to learn, learn together as we go. Um, 
that's that's the that's the end goal for sure. Zane says uh, 59 be messing up last year feels we need the all pro 59 this year. Yeah, and what's so cool is you've seen plays like that last year, Zane, and and it's like man, Devondre kind of took a step back, right? And then he comes out this year. And he, did, he never once did he complain or make an excuse last year. But he comes out this year and says, man, y'all had no idea the injuries I was dealing with. I think he had a bum shoulder. He had, he had like two or three injuries he was dealing with. He didn't complain one time. That's why we didn't know. It's kind of like Aaron's thumb. Hindsight, we're all like, yeah, hey, Aaron had a broken thumb. And we didn't find out until Big B uncovered that when he got to meet Aaron, right? It was just simply, yeah, it's hurt, but how hurt is it? Freaking things broke. <laughs> and he's out there throwing the football. That's why I gave Aaron a lot of grace last year, man. And, and it's why I'm kind of hesitant on Jordan. Like, hey, hold up a minute, guys. Like, Aaron was playing with a broken thumb, and that's why his play declined. But with his play declining, if Jordan just plays at that level, we might be looking at a similar season this year. And I just want to say I'm proud of Packer fans. Uh, my fellow Packer fans are very, very realistic about this year. I don't hear people saying, no, nope, we're going to – we're going to catch the world off guard and we're going to go win the Super Bowl. I hear them going, man, if, if love's good, we're going to go right back to that 11, 12, 13 win range. If he's bad, we're probably going to be in the six, you know, five to six win range. I, I love just how knowledgeable our fans are. I really do. Our fan base is awesome. Zane says, uh, you're right about that. Uh, the one guy messed up, the whole team messes up. It's, I mean, it's true. It's, uh, it's why it's so crucial to be on the same page and simplifying things for sure. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Uh, Lee in the chat says, comms were an issue, especially early. I wonder if staying on the field so long hurts the D2. Yeah, it definitely does, Lee. You know, time of possession is important. It's something that Jacob, one of my normal co-hosts, I feel like he does a good job pointing out time of possession. I get away from it a lot because the middle eight turnover differential, those things matter more to me than anything. But time of possession is important, man. It's just like an old school boxing match, right, or a UFC fight. There's some guys, you know, I couldn't tell you how many times I watched Conor McGregor fight. He was one of my favorite USC fighters. And and I, I watched him go up against Cowboy Cerrone. And, and I had a buddy, uh, uh, Byron, who uh, moved up here from, from the Bahamas. And he came over, or he was actually watching, uh, was going to tune into the game. And I won't go into all the details. We got in the stream, I'll just say that. And uh, he was like, hey, man, who's, who's going to win this fight? And my exact response to him was, um, you know, was, well, it depends on how long it goes. And he was like, what do you mean? What's that mean? Cause he was new to UFC. I'm like, you know, if Connor can finish him early, Connor's obviously the advantage is the match not going later, but the later it goes, Cerrone has more stamina than Connor. Right. And I said, so he said, okay, gotcha. I said, so here's what you want to look out for. Connor's going to come out real fast and try to end it quick. If he doesn't, the longer this match, the longer this fight goes, Cowboy Cerrone's got the advantage. Right. And lo and behold, Connor comes out, hits him with a couple of shoulders, breaks his nose, and finishes it in the first round. Byron was like, "What?" And I'm like, "Yeah, dude." And, and the reason I mentioned that in your comment here, Lee, is because I wonder if staying on the field uh, so long hurts the D too. It absolutely does, man. You know, what's the old Lombardi quote? Fatigue makes cowards of us all, right? You can't play fatigued. When you get tired, that's a different ball player out there. That's a different boxer out there. That's a different UFC fighter out there. You know, stamina is everything, too. Um, let's see here. Eric Southern and Mike Sherman is the reason we lost that game. <laughs> I, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> We're going to move on. Um, I, I, I have a hard time picking up on sarcasm, and you may be right there. John Money, got to love that guy. Completely agree, Zane. Man, I, I respect people who go against the grain just to tell the truth. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's awesome. Eric in the chat said, always bringing the comedy, says, Clayton, your voice alone makes Joe Barry a better coach. If my voice, if our defense is dependent on my voice and my accent, we're all screwed, Eric. But I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> I think the the best response I've gotten to my accent was Matt Ramage saying, "Man, you sound like a country singer." He didn't say it like it. Obviously, he said, "You sound like a country singer." And I, like, man, I can't help it. It is what it is. You think I speak uh, cornbread? You ought to hear my wife, man. Especially when we go home to Kentucky. Oh my God, we were both born and raised in Kentucky, and we get back home, man. Her shoes come off. She's walking around barefooted, eating tomatoes out of somebody's garden, and and she's talking like – I mean, she sounds like Ellie Mae Clampett. It is hilarious. All right, Kevin Wolf says, have you seen the tape on undrafted free agent from Fresno State? He's a he's a force fumble machine. I have not. Kevin, if you're still in here, before we wrap up, man, tell me that name. Of course, I could Google it. You don't have to do that. I'll go check it out for sure, man. Force fumbles is another thing that's very, very underrated. It's, it's one of the things that Woodson did so well, kind of that peanut punch. You know, when he would tackle, 
you know, peanut would kind of come in usually in, in a little uppercut, but would just mastered being able to drape with one hand and finish the tackle by smacking the ball, right? Um, he was he was great at that. And turnover differential is everything. And that's something that, you know, we've we seen a little bit last year, but those teams that force a lot of fumbles, and I know it sounds silly, it's, you know, it's just so simple, but it's true. The teams that force fumbles, they're the ones who uh, who have that advantage, man, in the turnover differential. And, and again, turnover differential is plus one. Your chances of winning is like over 70%. Plus two, it's over 80. Plus three is like a darn near 100% winning percentage when you've got that turnover differential. So, um, guys, I hope this made sense. And, again, um, my goal – isn't to to try to try to prove people wrong. It's just, hey, look, here are the facts. Here's the data, and we got one of the greatest compliments the other day from our live stream. And I appreciate you guys subscribing. If you haven't subscribed, just hit the sub button. Don't worry about notifications. We're trying to get our subs up so we can get noticed a little bit more. I don't ever want to come across like I'm trying to pressure people on this. It's just like the super chats. We got the super chats active now, um, so I've had people reach out in the past that they want to, you know, help uh, help support the show. That's an easy way to do it on YouTube. So uh, that's uh, that's something that's now active. But I don't want to ever come across like I just want to. We want the the compliment we got from the listener was you guys bring a good analytics base, you you bring good tape breakdown, and you bring humor entertainment, right? So we kind of got those three bases covered. That's the goal, man. We we just want to give you guys a uh, just a, just another avenue to get to get content and and do it in a visual aspect. Kevin in the chat says Aaron Mos- Mosby or Mosby is the name. I'll write it down and check it out, man. I'll go look at the tape, Kevin. Appreciate that. And good eye, man, uh, catching that he's a fumble-creating machine there for sure. It's it's absolutely huge. Um, another listener, I'll wrap up with this. I, I want to hit on this real quick. I heard a listener on uh, Packernet After Dark. Um, I think it was Jersey Mike, I believe. And uh, Jersey Mike had mentioned, um, you know, he just kind of gave his breakdown, about a nine-minute spill of what he would do to fix this defense. And, and like I said, I respect everybody's opinion, but uh, – I'm not. I'm not saying Jersey Mike was saying this, um, but it's the way it came off to me. So I'm just going to mention this briefly. Um, it came. He kind of came off like all we're doing is running quarters coverage, and we need to get more into man coverage and this and that, guys. That's that's not that's not the case. And and he may just be repeating what he's heard. Right. I'm going to put a graphic up on the on the screen here. This is the percentage of defense that we ran last year. Okay. This is defensive coverages between the twenties. Okay. Zero coverage, we ran 3.1% of the time. That was sixth most in the league. So for the people, and, and I'm not I'm not trying to put words into Jersey Mike's mouth, okay? It may not have been what he meant at all, but this it's just how I took – I came away from his take thinking like, man, he just thinks we're playing deep the whole time. We're just playing soft coverage. Guys, we ran zero coverage 3.1% of the time. You're going 3.1 ain't much. That was sixth most in the NFL. We ran cover one 14.1% or 14.7% of the time, 27th most in the league. So you can see we didn't run a whole lot of cover one, right? We didn't run a whole lot of cover two, although we ran a version of cover two we'll cover here in a second. Cover three, 36.1% of the time, we were 14th in the league in cover three. So we were like, we were in the top half of the league. Yeah, the top half of the league in cover three when people think we're just running quarters, right? We ran quarters the 10th most in the league at 16.6% of the time, absolutely. We ran quarter, quarter, half, which I refer to as quarter six zone, 13.1% of the time. That was eighth most in the league. So we ran a quarter, quarter, half, not just the quarters, you know, eighth most in the league. And then we had a cover five, 1.2% of the time, which is 14th most in the league. That cover two or a cover five, I'm sorry, is what I refer to as a cover two man, okay? That's typically what I refer to that as. Um, you know, cover two man, where you basically it's called a cover five because you've got five underneath with two on the shelf, right? And then with other 0.9% of the time. So, again, it might not have been what he was saying, but the the takeaway I got from it was like, man, he, he just thinks we're running quarters deep coverage, quarter zone coverage, right? And it's not the case. You see a good mix there, a zero in. That zero really kind of was like, whoa. Now, we, we're constantly showing two safeties on the shelf, and the reason being is because that prevents the quarterback from making a pre-snap adjustment, a pre-snap read, I should say. Okay, if if the quarterback comes to the line of scrimmage every single time, and we're showing two on the shelf, cover four shell, 
and he's got to treat it like a cover four shell. There's nothing in that defense that's tipping any information off to let him know this is going to be a spinner, this is going to be man match, this is going to be zone match, this is going to be drop. There's nothing there. All he knows is the the middle of the field deep is close. That's all he knows, right? Now, how do you attack that if they are in a true quarters? You attack the middle of the field like Coach Haddad said, which we seen him do in that first play that we highlighted. But again, if he had been playing his zone drop, right, his spot drop, it was covered up. And maybe he was playing the right zone match. If if Dre was playing the right zone match, what it simply means is Rasul was playing the wrong defense, Savage was playing the wrong defense, and Amos was playing the wrong defense. That's what it means. So I have a hard time believing that. So it's probably supposed to be spot drop like Coach Hadad had said. So. All right. Hope that made sense, guys. Um, let's finish up in the chat real quick. Let's see. Appreciate you uh, name dropping him for me. He said he was uh, – let's just pop, pop it up here for everybody watching. Um, I, I hope it's Mosby, Mosby. I, I hope I'm saying it right. I'm, I'm guessing it's Mosby. Was 2022 un, uh, undrafted free agent that the Packers wanted but signed with Carolina. Uh, they just cut him, and the Packers immediately picked him up and cut Hamilton. Wow. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. I'm excited to see him on the practice field today. Uh, have a great day, Packer Nation. This comes from Zane. Have a have a great day, Packer Nation. Stay blessed. Go Pack Go until next time. Yeah, appreciate you dropping by, Zane. You guys are awesome. So today we got practice at 1030. I'm going to pop the calendar up one more time here. Again, we just got to be determined on here, but we know the practice is going to be 1030 a.m. Central time. Of course, that's this Thursday right here. We're going to have the day off tomorrow on Friday. And then we got Packer Family Night on Saturday night at 7.30. Really excited about that. Um, we're going to be doing a post-game show immediately following uh, Packers Family Night. Okay? So you guys be ready for that. As soon as Family Night ends, we're going to go live. We're going to bring you press conference coverage, all that stuff. Kind of give you the, the latest um, information on anything that would have happened, both positive and negative. Unfortunately, we'll have to report the negative too. But that's what we're here for, man. We want to kind of keep our finger on the pulse and uh, understand exactly what's going on this year because, man, it, we're in the great unknown, guys. We uh, we don't know how this season's going to unfold, and it's exciting. It's, it's very exciting to me. Um, the other thing, uh, in the upper left corner, if you scan that QR code, that'll send you directly to Packernet Podcast. Ryan Schlipp does the Packernet Podcast. It's It's been my favorite Packer, uh, Packer podcast for probably four years now, three years now, however long it's been. It feels like I, I found him right around the time – that LaFleur was hired, I believe, if I remember correctly, um, and just been a big fan ever since. We've got great daily content on there. You know, obviously, uh, Packernet podcast. we got Jake Shavink with it. It's always draft season podcast. we got Jacob and the boys doing the Packernet fantasy podcast. And then, of course, we got mine in the rear here, uh, Packer, uh, Packers Total Access. But uh, those guys do a phenomenal job with their work. So just want to thank everybody for your time. This is a blast talking to you guys. Hopefully that made some sense. If you disagree, listen, guys, it's okay to disagree. It is. Um, that's the only time, you know, only time you learn. Hey, I don't want to say the only time the majority, the majority of what we learn, it, it comes from other opinions, right? It comes from people that, that we don't necessarily agree with, right? I know I've learned way more from people I disagree with than people that I agree with, you know, living in that echo chamber gets you nowhere, right? It gets you no smarter. And it's like Bill Walsh, the old Bill Walsh quote. Um, if we're all thinking alike, then none of us are thinking, right? So it's important to have that feedback. It's important to have that. Just do it in a respectful way. That's all I ask. People disagree with me in a respectful way. We may not come to the conclusion that we agree, right? And what will I say? Hey, I respectfully disagree, right? We're just not on the same page. But if you come in rude, guns a blazing, you're a moron, you're an idiot. I had a guy earlier today, huge following on Twitter was basically just in there making fun of me because I don't believe Joe Barry, this was Joe Barry's fault, right? What did I say? Hey, man, can you get on a live stream this morning? Let's get online and talk about it. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Crickets. He was responding every 30 seconds up to that point. Then crickets. It's funny how that works. So, anyway, appreciate you guys so much uh, for your time. It's always a blast hanging out with you. For those of you on the pod, thank you for making us a part of your day. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. And go Pack Go. The power sweep. Actually, it's the it's the lead play in our in our offense. Tell the tackle to take the defensive end if he's over him. If he's not, we drive down the first man who is inside. Pull back, we tell him to take the first man outside the offensive tackle. No one shows. He goes right by them and feels inside. If the YN has the linebacker taken out, he cuts inside. If the YN has the linebacker in. 
comes all the way around. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. First taste of rare bourbon you finally got your hands on. That's nice. At Caskers.com, we make this experience easy. Caskers is a one-stop spirit curator with an impressive selection of exclusive sought-after rare and household names in the realm of premium spirits and champagne. Discover the top flavors of the year now by going to Caskers.com and using code WELCOME10 for $10 off your first purchase. Get $10 off your first purchase with code WELCOME10 at Caskers.com. <laughs> 